First, who am I? I'm Paul Timmons. I'm the senior network engineer for Clear8. Um, I've been in the industry for about 17 years. I've done stuff with um, like reading tariffs, uh, consumer advocacy. I've helped out uh, law enforcement agencies with trying to serve subpoenas to carriers. Or most recently, I helped. Uh, the uh, DHS locate switches in Puerto Rico that were destroyed in the uh, tsunami, the uh, hurricane. So I've got a lot of data and experience and can kind of help companies and people uh, in the government figure out where assets are, what they need to do to protect them, things like that. Uh, I've been with ClearRate 11 years and was responsible for a lot of the initial construction of our network and I'm very deeply involved to this day. So what is ISDN PRI? Um, when ISDN first came out in the early 80s, um, it was meant to be a complete replacement for the PSTN. They wanted to get rid of all the analog and go pure digital. Um, so there were two things that they came up with. They called the primary rate interface and the basic rate interface. The BRI, as some of you may know, ended up commonly being used for uh, high speed dial up back in the early days, 128K. Um, the initial idea was it was supposed to be everybody's phones gets replaced with this, you're going to be able to interoperate it with decked handsets and all sorts of other things. But there was a lot of politics and technology that got in the way, so a lot of the old school engineers called it, I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because it never really captured its full intent. Um, it was part of a larger upgrade of the network to things like out-of-band signaling, SS7, and other technologies we do use. But it never really hit the full vision of what they were intending to do. So what does it stand for? Integrated Services Digital Network. Um, there was a few different drivers behind this. A lot of them were uh, revenue related actually. There was a lot of toll fraud that used to occur. Um, back in the 70s there were these devices people could make called blue boxes that would allow them to take over a call, terminate it, impersonate another phone switch and then re-originate the call to some other location that costs more so they could say call American Express on their toll-free number blast a 2600 Hertz tone then use a special keypad and make a new call out to California back when it used to cost a buck fifty a minute and what ended up showing up on their bill was a call to a toll-free number and American Express would get billed for an inbound toll-free call that lasted three hours Realistically, there was a call going across the country to their buddy in California that no one paid for. So the integrated services digital network allowed them to take the signaling out of the voice path so that you couldn't pretend to be a phone switch with just a little box that cost you 10 bucks at Radio Shack. So, um, that, that part has been fully realized, obviously. Phone companies do not like getting uh, hit with charges they didn't intend to uh, pass on. Um, what we commonly use today is the primary rate interface. This is delivered over a T1 line. It's 23 voice channels and one data channel. Uh, the data channel is used for signaling. So it is a tried and true traditional multi-line business trunking solution. And I'll get to what trunking is here in a minute. It's an all-digital service. Your voice is converted to a stream of ones and zeros and then transmitted across the T1. So things like the line getting longer doesn't make your voice quieter. It just makes the ones and zeros quieter and computers can deal with that. It's delivered using time division multiplexing. And what that means is that we take, say, a section of your, or a few milliseconds of your voice we turn it into a digital data stream that moves faster than just the second, the eight second millisecond sample or whatever. And we dedicate one of 24 time slots for it that occurs over that same length of time. So 
Uh, I wish I had a diagram. But basically, you have, say, in 8 milliseconds, I can transfer 24 8 millisecond samples of audio. What this does mean is that the voice is very predictable compared to SIP. There's no what we call jitter, where the latency changes in the middle of the call. This can be really bad for things that are like modems or other things, which I'll get into. It's 64K clear channel. For anyone who has like an older um, video conferencing unit that uses ISDN, um, you can transport those over PRI as well. Uh, we actually have a box that we can sell you for that. Um, and it has a dedicated signaling channel providing call metadata. This is where your caller ID, the DID digits that were dialed, um, caller ID with name data, and other things are sent. So, you know, you don't run into some of the analog issues where you've got to wait for it to, like, pulse out your DID on an analog trunk. It just comes in as part of the call setup. The components are pretty simple. You've got our switch, you've got your PBX, and you've got a T1 line. Um, in ISDN PRI, your service is, your phone switch is seen almost as a peer of our network. It's not it, technically a subscriber, but the protocols used to speak to each other are very similar to what are used to speak between phone company switches. So the actual uh, feature sets tend to be very much in um, parity with, with what we use internally. The probes, you've got rock solid connectivity. We've had 15, 20 years or more to work out any interoperability issues that are occurring between phone switches and PBXs. Um, do they still occur sometimes? Yeah, but for the most part, you're taking 1970s T1 technology, layering on 1980s digital signaling, and you know you plug it in, set a couple parameters, and it just works. It's got guaranteed capacity. If I sell you PRI with 23 voice channels, no matter what, you've got 23 voice channels. There's not going to be a time when you're downloading something from the internet and really can only use three of them, you know. And it's a traditional circuit delivery. Um, for customers who have older phone systems or are just more comfortable with uh, established technology, this can be a very good thing for you. It has no delays, so you're not waiting on an analog line to pick up, dial a bunch of digits, and then cut you through. You're not waiting on DID digits to come in before the call starts ringing. And because of the time slots, you've got a guaranteed audio path that takes basically just over the, sp just over the speed of light to get to the other side. You have no jitter. <laughs> that again is where the latency changes mid-call. So because the latency is practically none, the variance in latency is practically none. So this means that stuff like fax machines, modems, things like that work terrific over this technology. <laughs> and you have no firewalls. And as we get into SIP, and I'll talk about it, you have to have additional networking equipment to do SIP safely. Um, with ISDN and PRI, you get the circuit from us, you plug it in, and you move on with your day. It's just neat. It's just an RJ45 patch cord. And you don't have to deal with QoS. There's a million ways to set that up wrong and only a handful of ways to set that up right. But again, click, click, and you're done. There's QoS? Quality of service. Um, I would touch on that a bit when we get to SIP and then I'll go much deeper in the MPLS talk because it, that I'm giving near the end of the day. It really gets deeper in there. So what is it great for? Dial-up modems. A lot of people are like, well, I'm not a 1990s ISP. What are you talking about? But a lot of people do have things like postage meters. Um, some people may even still have payroll systems that call ADP and upload a file. I hope not but I see weird things every day. 
there may still be times when you need to use a modem to call something. Like maybe you're a municipality and you have modems inside of remote pump sites or um, you know some sort of drainage pump or something <laughs> like that. So doing that over SIP might be pretty problematic. Doing it on an ISDN PRI, this is the era of dial-up modems. It works great. Uh, fax servers. There's been a lot of uh, progress in doing fax over IP and other things, but when it comes down to it, if you're a law office and you have like a ton of paper fax machines, um, it can be hit or miss. Um, this is a traditional technology, much like an analog POTS line, and it's practically invented for fax. There is some cons, and it depends, you know, you want redundancy? Buy a second T1. That's not a con for me, but it's definitely a con for you. Um, do you need more than 23 channels? Buy a second T1. <laughs> what other cons exist? Copper only delivery. While I can put this over the ONTs that Adtran was talking about earlier, um, by and large, that's not how we're delivering it. We'll be bringing it in over a copper line into your building. For some people, they go, man, our copper lines have always been rock solid. I don't mind that. I'm sure by now the mass, vast majority of you, you're going, oh, God, not that. <laughs> um, you know, it's been decades since most of the ILEX in the area or in any of the areas have really taken charge of their copper cable plant and repaired it correctly. You know, I've seen numerous times where there's trash bags of the cross-connect boxes. Um, in one case, I saw AT&T repaired a phone line by taking a cable and a thing of wood, and they used clamps and clamped the cable to the wood and left it aerial with a chunk of wood there. And it wasn't until I threatened to report that to Warren City Council with photos and asked that their franchise agreement be looked at, that they actually decided that that was a big enough issue to address. They just kept telling me, well, your customer doesn't go over that. Because I had a customer who was having trouble randomly for six years, so we went and walked the entire distance between their building and the CO, and we found stuff like that. We found automotive hoses that had been slit, and then they used clamp. They, used, they put it around the line and then put a clamp on it and tightened it down. I mean, yeah, it's waterproof, but it's not a 30-year solution. They're not UV stable. <laughs> They're meant to go under your hood, not on a telephone line that's going to be in the sun for years on end. It's a great temporary fix, but it never got done. And I could go on and on and on and on about the things that are done to the copper network to keep it afloat. Um, but I'd say it's probably going to be the weakest link in the PRI chain. It's outside. Things happen out there. So what is SIP trunking? It stands for Session Initiation Protocol. Um, that's kind of a bunch of words. doesn't mean much. But now I can get into trunking a bit. So what is the difference between a trunk and a line? Um, these terms are sometimes used interchangeably by people, but there is industry accepted terms. Um, a line is typically a subscriber facing line that is dedicated to a specific phone number. So if you had a phone line at your house, we would call that a line. You put a phone on it, you call one number and it rings. You pick it up, you get dial tone, make a call out, and it comes from one number. When you're looking at trunking, you're looking at an audio path that we can use for various things. Um, you can have a call come in and it will say, this is actually a call for 248-556-4532. And it knows that rings Paul's desk. And instead of all your phone lines going into a receptionist or into an IVR that says, enter your party's extension at any time, you can issue direct numbers for everyone in your company without having you know, a hundred staff and a hundred phone lines. Because with trunking, you can say, these are the, I need this many channels up 
in order to transport all the calls we're doing. And then the metadata of the DID can be used in both directions. You can send the caller ID data so that it com looks like it's coming from your desk or maybe the main call center phone number or make it so everybody's phone has the front desk's number or maybe the executive's phone comes with the secretary's phone number on the outbound caller ID. So people call back, they get a secretary. There's a lot of options when you have trunks and that applies to PRI and SIP. So SIP trunking is again an all digital voice product. In this case, the voice is broken up into individual IP packets in typically 20 millisecond chunks. There are ways to make it adjusted, but almost all cases you're looking at 20 milliseconds of voice goes into one IP, IP packet. We throw a header on the front and send it over the internet. It works over practically any internet connectivity that has suitable delay and jitter. I find myself continually surprised at what people are able to actually run SIP over and have it function. Certainly there are better <coughs> options than others, but I mean, I've seen people do SIP over cell phones. I've seen people do SIP over, I mean, once as an experiment, I did it over a dial-up connection. We just used a low bandwidth codec just because someone told me you can't do SIP over dial-up. I'm like, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> It allows for rich metadata. It supports services such as voice encryption and video calling. Because the SIP itself is really the signaling path, and we call the audio RTP, you can do things like negotiate T38, which is a fax protocol that allows you to actually transmit the image of the fax instead of the squealing tones. And then on the far end, a modem plays that back into tones. So you're actually converting your fax machine's audio into a TIFF file. It gets streamed over UDP, and then that TIFF file gets streamed back out into a modem. So when you're running into things where I said delay and latency, that kind of takes it out of the loop. Downside to that, well, none of those implementations are perfect. I found sometimes like a brother fax machine will go nuts if you call it with certain implementations of a T38 modem. I've literally had them lock up where the front terminal doesn't work on an inbound call. It's not just them, and it's not all models, but it does happen. Um, voice encryption is a newer product we can offer where uh, we will do a um, AES encoded audio over your internet connection. So if you have regulatory requirements or just feel uncomfortable with using it over the public internet, we can work with you if your phone system supports it so that your calls are individually encrypted as they go over the internet. So if they get intercepted, there's no real way to decode them. Um, and with QoS tagging, which we offer on practically every product, if you order a clear rate connection and a SIP product, we make sure that um, our network will tag it as the highest priority traffic on our network. So you're not going to have a problem where, you know, someone fires up a YouTube stream and suddenly all the calls get choppy. Um, we implement queuing where all the voice packets jump to the front of the line when your circuit gets full and they are the least, last likely to be discarded. Um, I get into that a lot more in the uh, MPLS stuff. but. If you've had a bad taste in your mouth because of something like Skype for Business getting choppy or any of those other competitors, I'm not going to call them out by name, but you probably know who they are. Um, if you're hooking up clear rate service to a clear rate SIP trunk, those aren't going to be issues you have. So what components exist for SIP? You've still got your R switch, and you've got our, your PBX. But now we have an internet connection of some sort. It could be ours, it could be someone else's. But you also have to introduce a firewall. We have some customers who don't do that. And then what ends up happening? Someone chooses a bad password for their mailbox or their extension. They're like, well, I'll go in and change this later. I'll just set extension 100's password to 100. 
right now I'm telling you that as we speak, our network is getting bombarded with SIP call attempts to practically every IP address on it. And what they're looking for is people who have badly configured PBXs. And when they find them, the first thing they do, they start hammering out hundreds of calls to like the Philippines, uh, East Timor, um, sat phone prefixes in Australia. Um, those things cost thousands of dollars within minutes. And uh, unfortunately, because of international treaties, we have no choice but to pay that bill to the other country. Even if we know that they're giving half of that money back to the fraudster who hacked you to begin with, they're completely out of our jurisdiction. They often operate out of other countries. We can't sue them. So when it comes down to it, if you don't have a firewall set up correctly so that it's not allowing practically anyone in the world to talk to your phone system, the odds are one day you are going to be hacked. And we have a lot of stuff that we build into our network to try to detect that early and shut your international off quickly and to opt in to high cost traffic. But at the end of the day, if you look at the contract, it's your legal responsibility to pay because it's our legal responsibility to pay. We can't eat the costs of a misconfiguration on your end. We'll work with you, but at the end of the day, you know, it's not something you can go and get out of and say, well, but I was a victim. It's like, be that as it may, you left the door wide open. Mm -hmm. When they took your TV, there was some culpability. Mm. What are the pros? Mm. It's available over internet connections. This means that practically anything you can use to get internet can be used to get phone calls. When we're talking about a copper line tied down to one street address versus find an internet connection with a public IP and let us know what it is. That changes the ball game as far as things like um, upgrading connectivity, moving phone systems around, disaster recovery, um, failover, things like that. All the stuff you can build into an internet connection, you can build into SIP trunk. The other pro, most phone systems you buy today, they're already using SIP or another IP protocol. If you buy a PRI card for it, you're just converting the PRI that we give you back into SIP to go to your handsets. Why do that? Leave it as packet and send it to us as packet. We'll process it as packet. We may even deliver it to the other carrier as packet. If you call T-Mobile, for example, we hand that directly to T-Mobile as IP. It never becomes legacy TDM. So there could be conversions that take time or affect the quality that are completely unnecessary if you have a full IP network. Some of the things we can do, provided you get a hold of us early in the day, you know, and a number of other things. We can change the call capacity. For us, it's a little box in the switch that says, how many calls can this guy have? 200? Click 205. Submit. Um, did your IP address change because you used a cable modem provider that I won't name that decided to change your IP overnight? Call us up. All right, you're set. Very simple. Um, if you need us to change call capacity, you have to go through sales support. But they'll try to work with you quickly. You know, it's not like traditional TDM where you run into oh, we started out a new inbound calling campaign, it's more successful than we ever realized, and it's gonna take two weeks because we gotta install another PRI. This is a completely different product in that respect. What are the cons? You're gonna have possibly some additional costs. You're gonna have your phone system, while it may natively support SIP, will often charge you extra to unlock that feature. It could be substantially less than, you know, the one-year savings that you'll gain by going to SIP because it's often, and I don't quote me on this, but it's often cheaper to go SIP trunking with us because you're already paying for some other form of connectivity. We have to build connectivity into a PRI. But I don't want you to just go think, oh, cool, I'll switch it tomorrow because I've got, say, a MyTel. Well, I think they charge somewhere between four to $800 one time turn SIP trunking on. 
So you'll need to get with your phone system vendor before you just decide to do this because, well, turn up day, it's going to get awkward. Additional investments may be required. We're talking firewalls, potentially Ethernet switches, or other network elements. If today your phone line comes in on one side of the building, you may be able to take that over a copper, two copper pair to the other side of the building without equipment. If it's over 300 feet, now it's Ethernet, we're going to have to put in things like uh, Ethernet to copper converters or install a fiber optic cable to get around the distance limitations of Ethernet. You may run into Ethernet switches that remove the QoS tags. A lot of older ones do that by default. Some of them can be changed, some of them can't. Most modern switches made in the last five to 10 years, it's not a problem you run into, but we find surprises all the time. And as I said, the firewall, I can't stress enough how important it is that that be installed and configured correctly. If you don't have remote staff using your phone system, lock it down so it can only talk to us. Then you don't have to worry that packets are gonna come in from Malaysia or something and initiate a call through your PBX and either compromise the voice security of it by listening to your voicemails or more than likely just hammer a ton of calls through us until we catch it and shut it off, which we endeavor to do that so quickly, but it still ends up costing you several hundred to several thousand dollars before we can get to that switch and hit it. And that's with automation. These guys will bring up the calls so quickly because they know they're going to get caught within five or six minutes by most fraud algorithms, which we do run. And so they're going to go wide open for that five minutes and try to capture as much as they can. How that stuff works is that often I'll say, I'm a scammer. I go to a company in East Timor and I say, hey, what, if I brought you a thousand voice minutes, would you give me a cut of the money you're getting in from the other countries when the calls come in? They say, sure, man, go ahead. Have them call this number, we'll know that, we'll give you the money. Now I'm off in the EU or some Eastern Bloc country somewhere, so you're not going to come ever, you're never going to find me. And East Timor doesn't care. They're just going to send me a check. There's nothing illegal about receiving phone calls and sharing the money. And they're not going to look too closely at how those calls got to them because it doesn't benefit them at all to do so. So then I, or someone I hire goes in, hacks your phone system, guesses your passwords, does other things, makes a bunch of calls to East Timor. You get stuck with the bill. We get stuck with the bill. We pay that to East Timor because we don't get a choice. East Timor gives the guy his cut, he moves on, never gets caught. So that firewall, probably the most important investment you can make when you're doing SIP trunking. So that way you can do things like protect remote phones with IPsec, or lock them down, or make it have a SIP aware function like a session border controller that screens out all the repeated password attempts on extensions. There's VoIP compatibility issues that exist. As I said before, modems, they really don't like the additional latency. And when I say that, because we're taking 20 milliseconds of your audio, putting it in an internet packet, and sending it across the internet with its delay. Your delay can be as high as, say, a very short international call. A lot of modem equipment was meant for domestic calls. So the round trip time of the audio is only a few milliseconds. When you add all the queuing, the jitter buffers, the latency of putting a packet on, queuing, QoS, it can add time. And it doesn't affect the audio quality, but to a modem, that could be just complete death. Fax machines, same sort of issue. There's slightly different noises on the line, but when it comes down to it, they really hate that change in uh, latency. I can give you picture perfect, absolutely crystal clear audio that even professional equipment can't tell the difference. But modems will because they take that they need that round trip time. They send a squeal down the line. That squeal has to be responded to with a different kind of squeal within 12 milliseconds. Well, my queuing delays 20 milliseconds before I even put it in an IP packet. So 
Sorry, you can't handshake. Credit card terminals. A lot of these, they're just 300 or 1200 baud modems. Um, the good news is a lot of them now, you can go to your car merchant provider and get an ethernet connected or cellular connected one. They're more convenient, they're almost instantaneous, there's no dial-up delay, and it won't stand in the way of your SIP traffic. Alarm panels. Some carriers have real issues with alarm panels on their IP networks. ClearAid's gone through a lot of effort to not have those issues. But you may run into issues. If you decide, well, I've got a SIP trunk, I'll just hook my alarm panel up to the PBX's FXS port and save the cost of the alarm line. That's great, and it'll probably work 90% of the time. But when the power goes out and you've got a 12-hour battery in your alarm panel, and you've got 20 minutes of UPS on your phone system, your building is literally unprotected after 20 minutes because it can't call out anymore. So you get a power outage, someone could rob you blind. And it's just sitting there making a ton of noise trying to pick up the line with no actual ability to do so. So you gotta think about that. Postage meters, a lot of the older ones, they're 56K or 14 Ford modems. They call uh, Pitney Bowes, they send a data file, they receive a data file, and that has all your postage in it. They make Ethernet connected ones. If you switch to IP, you just need to ask them for them. I think they charge a minimal fee, if anything. I think if you're near your end of your contract, they just say renew it, we'll give you a new one. Um, it also requires coordination between your IP vendor and your phone system vendor. You probably caught on to that because I'm talking about firewalls, Ethernet switches, but we have a lot of customers where there's finger pointing between these two vendors and they're different vendors. Um, so maybe the phone system vendor wants you to use their IT services, but you have an existing relationship with another IT company for years. They're always going to try and throw those other company under the bus. Well, if you've got to make it all work perfectly together, you've got a political problem that technology really can't solve. Because any time there's any sort of issue, there's going to be finger pointing. We've had customers, when they switch to IP, they've had to run separate cables to every phone. So that way, the data guys can't say, well, your phone did it. Well, it's on its own completely separate network with its own Ethernet switches, with its own firewall. That adds expense. It's doable but it's better if they can work together, obviously. It can save you a ton of money. So, is ISDN PRI or SIP trunking better? It depends. What are you doing with it? What is your phone system support? And what do you want to use it for? If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, I am going to be discussing QoS later on in the MPLS talk near the end of the day. I'll try not to make it too boring. Um, but if there's any non-QoS related questions, I'd be more than happy to take them. <coughs>